Take it away, Jane. Okay, so today I'm going to be presenting photo period um, specifically in mayors. So first we have to understand what reading rhythms are, and there are two types. We have the daily rhythms, which are also called circadian, and they are the biological rhythm in all mammals that last 24 hours or just a day. Um, that's how we know when it's time to sleep, time to be awake. We also have the annual rhythms, or the circ circa-annual rhythm, which is just um, the biological rhythm that lasts one year, or 365 days. We also have to understand what a seasonal breeder is, um, and you are all um, probably familiar with it, but it's an animal species that only mates successfully during certain times of the year in order to optimize the survival of the young. Therefore, we term them as long day or short day breeders. And there are many factors that influence this seasonal breeding, such as ambient temperature, food and water availability, and predation behavior. Um, for example, in mares or long day breeders, this means that um, at least temperature, temperature is warmer, there is more food and water available, and um, predators are easily seen because the day is long and they're they are exposed to light more, more often. Um, and that all influences both the mother and the young. So um, the survival is optimized. So mares are seasonally polyesterous. They are long day breeders, as I just mentioned. Um, and they are anesterous during the winter. Estrus, as we've studied before, is a period of sexual receptiv receptivity. Um, mares are usually, um, as I said, they're polyesterous, so they have at least three or four intervals during the breeding season, and they are anesterous during the winter. Um, this means that the ovaries are inactive and the cervix may be closed. So generally speaking, reproductive, the reproductive active period occurs one gestation length before the optimal time for the offspring to be born. Therefore, in mares, it take, their gestation period is 11 months or 335 days. So um, the peak fertility occurs during the summer so that the offspring can be born in the spring. Okay, I want to interject something. Notice the uterus is flaccid. What's the antonym of flaccid? Turgid. Very good. T-U-R-G-I-D. The uterus is turgid during estrus. If you ever are into palpation, you can actually physically feel a turgid uterus. And then you can actually feel a flaccid uterus. So turgid is usually under the influence of estrogen. Take it away, Jane. Okay, and here we, we don't go into detail about the reproductive system itself, but I just included a picture so we have a general idea of where everything is. And um, over here, I have a, a nice diagram that illustrates the when they are, when their optimal breeding season is relative to the months of the year. As I mentioned, um, they are they are usually bred during the, sp the summer so that the offspring can be born during the spring. Um, and there are these little transition periods um, between April and March for spring and between October and November, which is usually autumn. And then over here, this is winter when the when they are anestrous. Okay, so moving on to photo period and how it relates to breeding seasons. So for photo period is a period of time dur during which an animal is exposed to light, or generally speaking, uh, it's the day length. So melatonin is a protein hormone that is produced in the pineal gland. Um, and it is known as a hormone of darkness because it is usually produced um, during hours of darkness since it's inhib inhibited by light. Therefore, this means that we have low levels during the day and high levels during the night. And it is, it is very interesting because melatonin serves as a hormonal sign signal that tracks the seasonal changes. Um, and therefore, this helps regulate the reproductive system. Um, so during the winter, since we have low levels of melatonin, 
uh, this this protein hormone inhibits the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone or GnRH, uh, which is responsible for stimulating the growth of the gonads. And this helps explain why uh, the ovaries in mares, at least, are so small and inactive during the winter because um, there is no GnRH being released. And also, um, we, it, it is possible to manipulate the photo period of mares in order to speed up, speed up the breeding season and the ovulation. So after a period of um, anestrus or after winter, we can hasten the, the ovulation by exposing mares to at least 16 hours of light per day for a period of eight to 10 weeks. Um, it is very recommended that it's eight to 10 weeks in order to be effective. If it's any less than that, um, it might not, not work. Um, and light is recommended to be supplemented at dusk instead of the morning. Um, and they can be stimulated individually in stalls or in groups. Uh, this way mare, you, you ensure that mares give birth in January and breed in time for spring. Oh, and over here, um, this is kind of a picture of the of the light systems that they use to supplement light and installs. And that is all okay. Good. Excellent. Questions for Jane? Here's one. Did you say that melatonin was high or low? In the winter, it's high, mm -hmm. and therefore it inhibits the GnRH, and that's why um, ovaries are small and inactive. Because in the winter, there's more hours of dark, mm -hmm. and dark equals melatonin in a sense, right? And then I, thank you, Jane. You can sit down if you want. I just want to refresh your memory on GnRH. Now, there, Jane said there'd be no GnRH. Oh, I'm going to, oh, you're, are you going back to your uh, email? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, good. Um, it would be lower. There's always going to be some hormone around GnRH. And if you remember, GnRH is a neural peptide, okay, because it's released um, from the hypothalamus. And anything from the hypothalamus would be neural, a neural peptide, okay? So then it goes down the portal system to the anterior pituitary. I'm trying to re refresh your endocrinology. And then it releases two hormones. And so that's unusual. Usually a releasing hormone from the hypothalamus just releases one hormone from the anterior pituitary. But GnRH has this uh, property that it goes to the anterior pituitary, which is very short distance, and then it releases LH and FSH. Okay? So that's one thing about GnRH. And by the way, you can buy it in a bottle, some analog, that's also an agonist of GnRH, and it probably has a half-life longer than the native hormone. So you can buy GnRH if you want to. Uh, what else? Okay, so then Jane said the gestation length of a mare is on the average, I think, did you say 335, Jane? Uh, some people would say 335, but it varies. There's a lot of differences It can be so that's about 11 months. Sometimes it can be 10 months, some can almost 12 months, depending on the breed and the animal and everything there. So 335, 333 is a good uh, generalization. Okay, so then I want to take off from that and reiterate some of the things she said. And I want to make sure you know the definition of photo period. <clears throat> and because there's many out there, <clears throat> but this is the one I like. The period of time each day during which an organism receives light, whether it be artificial or natural. So it's like, if, the, if you say the photo period is like 18, then six hours would be dark, right? So make sure you understand that. And there's usually a way when people uh, write about photo period, you always have these two numbers, and I want to show you that. And this was a, uh, just a random 
diagram. Well, I guess I already have that here, don't I? See right here? So like in this experiment, for some reason, they were giving here six hours of light and 18 darkness. So there's always this, these two numbers that are separated by a colon. So it's like six colon 18, that would mean six hours of daylight or light treatment, okay? So make sure you, that that'd be a great little quest, quiz question. I put some ratio there and then say, how many hours of dark did this animal get or how many hours of light did this get, okay? And the two numbers should always add up to 24, though, okay? <laughs> so you could have one, so like, and that's another good question. What if I say in this ratio, the first number is two, then what's the second number gotta be? 22, see that? It's always gotta be, add up to 24, and it's some kind of ratio. And by convention, the first number always designates, designates the hours of light. It's always that way. So you just see a, these two numbers, they did the LD, but a lot of times you won't see that. You'll just see six colon 18 or something like that. So that's the way that's designated. <clears throat> okay, so then, we can talk about uh, melatonin a little more. And so I will do my Google melatonin and see what we come up with. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, so first of all, you can buy melatonin. Kate, okay, good question here. Um, on the previous page on the meeting, Bottom, it had the same ratio, but it said SP instead of LDs. Yeah, and you know, I, I'm not sure in that experiment what that means. We can, I can look at it later and okay. tell you. Yeah, good question. Okay, so melatonin. I, I got a bottle in my office. I don't take melatonin, but I just, you know, just to prove it, you can buy it on the shelf. And supposedly, it's supposed to help with sleep in the human population. Um, it's supposed to help you sleep better. Does anybody, did anybody here in the last couple of weeks, there was something about melatonin in the news about this one woman, what she did with melatonin? Any, does that ring a bell? Anybody? Go ahead, tell me what you think. Okay, say it louder. A woman giving her kids melatonin or either that or was that a daycare? It was a daycare. The daycare operator was giving the kids melatonin because then maybe they all go to sleep and you get a little break. But here's the thing that happened with this woman. You know what she did? I don't know how, I don't know how many kids, because this was in the newspaper. It's illegal to do this, by the way. She gave the kids melatonin. They were all sleeping. She went to the gym and the tanning salon. Okay, do you know how dangerous that is? Because whenever you do something like that, you say, what's the worst case scenario? What if the house started on fire? And all the kids would have died. You know what I mean? You know how dangerous that is? I mean, on the surface, it's like, okay, big deal, they're all sleeping. No. What if the worst case scenario is a fire could have started and all, I don't know how many kids there were. But yeah, she, I think she's going to, uh, I think she got sentenced to jail term. Okay, I mean, that's, if I would have been a parent there, I'm afraid I would have strangled her. Because that's putting kids, I mean, their lives were at risk. Okay, I'm recording that. No, I would not have strangled, strangled her. Okay, so in your notes you should say, melatonin is orally active. Okay, you can... Take it as a pill, or you can feed it to animals. Anybody know what animal you would feed it to? Yes? I gave some of my pigs before. Pigs? And why did you do that? Um. <laughs> okay. okay, so you could go to the gym? No. Okay. Was there a good reason? Oh, really? Okay, so this is relatively new. Okay, giving pigs melatonin. Here's where you can give it to sheep. 
You feed it to sheep and they think the nights are longer. And if you know anything about sheep, that's a signal for them to start ester cycles. Because they're short day breeders. So they start breeding their ester cycles in the fall when the nights are longer, and if nights are longer, there's more melatonin around, right? So you can fake out the sheep by feeding it melatonin, and ester cycles might start sooner, okay? There's probably some experiments done on that. I know some people do that. So it's orally active. It survives the rumen, the must, right? If, you're, if you get some effect. So anyway, so that's melatonin. Let me see about this, uh, this diagram here. And so, okay, so I'm not gonna, oops, sorry. I, okay, and one of the TAs, Aaron, you're on, are you on a computer? Look up the half-life of melatonin for me. Okay, so here we go. This is just showing you, <laughs> this is gonna disappear. Um, notice how even during the day, there's still some melatonin around. So that's the, the thing is, there's never a hormone that goes to zero. Just make sure you know that, okay? Uh, melatonin, look at that, picograms per milliliter. See that over here? Picograms, that's PG, okay? How many 10 to the minus what is a picogram? Anybody know? See, milla is minus three, right, to the third. Uh, micro is six, nano is nine, pico is 12. Oh, sorry. Is that what you're gonna say? 10 to the minus 12. So the thing is, not much around, okay? And then the pineal gland's producing melatonin in the evening, so somehow there's some dark there, and it takes a while to get higher blood levels, but look at they go from about 10 to 70, so that's seven-fold difference, okay? Aaron? So like the drug melatonin half-life is about 60 minutes. 60 minutes? Yeah. Okay, so half-life of melatonin is 60 minutes. Relatively short, I mean in one, in one sense. Of course, different animals would have different half-lives, right? Different metabolic states, all that stuff, okay? So that's melatonin, orally active. Uh, I think some of the reading talks about its synthesis. Then the next thing I want to do is talk about the pineal gland. I think that's about, you know, there's a structure there. There's melatonin, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, anybody ever found the pineal gland in an animal? Anybody ever dissected one out? I've dissected it out of a cow. Fun. It's easy because it's not buried in the brain. It's right on the outer part of the brain. So let me do this and enlarge this. Okay. So, a couple things about the pineal gland. You know there are two hemispheres to the brain, right? The left hemisphere, right. I'm going to reset my camera. He's a lucky guy. Okay. So, there's two hemispheres, left and right, but they're connected by a band of tissue called the corpus callosum. See up there in the upper right hand, that's the spelling. The corpus callosum. It's quite a landmark. It's a band of tissue that connects the left hemisphere with the right hemisphere. Do you know years ago, um, they used to do brain surgery and cut that connection in people that had a lot of epileptic seizures? Sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. But if, you're, if you like brain stuff, you should read the book called The Social Brain. Because when the corpus callosum is there, the left brain talks to the right brain and vice versa. But if you cut it, they don't talk to each other. And it's a fascinating study in neurology because then you can visually send images to the right side of the brain without the left side seeing it. 
And let's say we have like a funny cartoon up on the screen. And we have these, what's called split, split brain patients. Somebody was fascinating. They, they said, oh, we're cutting all this brain tissue. And then we have these patients that their hemispheres can't communicate. So they did some studies. So they sent a funny cartoon up to the right side of the brain without the left side. And you can do this visually with the, with the experiment. And the person laughed. Then you ask them, why are you laughing? They could not tell you. Because language comes from the left hemisphere. They sent the image to the right. The person laughed. But then the person couldn't tell them why they laughed. It's fascinating. OK. Anyway, so this corpus callosum is a, quite a landmark. And then the pineal gland. It's hard to see. It's right back here. I'm going to find probably a better image. Let me follow that line here. It's right there. So here's the kicker. The pineal gland is on the median plane, the medial plane. It's like right between the two hemispheres. And it's like, looks like a little pine cone. And that's why, that's how it's got its name. Look at pine, P-I-N-E up there, right? So it looks like a little pine cone. And it's on the surface of the brain, and it's always on the very exact midline. And sometimes you call that midline the mid-sagittal plane, right? Mid-sagittal equals medial, and it's right there. So it actually, it's, you can generate animals that are pineal ectomized. Because the surgery is pretty straightforward. You don't go in the brain tissue, it's on top. And so they've done studies years ago taking out the pineal gland of the animals. Pineal ectomized, right? Ectomized means removal. Let me see if I can uh, find a little better picture, because what I'm going to do is search pineal gland cattle. <clears throat> and here's, uh, yeah, there it is. <clears throat> oh, by the way, this is, a, oh, this, this is my buddy at Colorado. Oh, he's done a great job. I forgot he had that. Okay, so this is probably maybe sheep, I can't remember, a oh, horse, of a horse, okay. So, <clears throat> to orientate you, my arrow is pointing in a rostral direction. What's that mean? Towards the nose. Because when you're doing brain surgery, you never use cranial. You can't use cranial. So this is rostral, and this is what? Caudal, caudal rostral. There's the corpus callosum. It's a landmark. So look at you cut the brain in half, and it doesn't even look like you did anything with the. This is the left hemisphere, then, right? Look at you didn't damage it at all by cutting the brain in half. And there's the pineal gland. Here's the up. Here's the uh, closer picture, but it's always kind of pointing back and on the midline. And then here's a close-up, pineal gland, and then the third ventricle. You should know that the brain has chambers, spaces, and they're all called ventricles, just like the heart has ventricles. Okay? And what would be found in the third ventricle? Because there's not air in it. Cerebral spinal fluid. Okay? So the brain has chambers, they're all called ventricles, and they all have cerebral spinal fluid in them. So there's the pineal gland. So relatively easy to do a pineal ectomized animal. Okay? Okay, let's see what else do we have here. Let me go to here, do a couple clicks. Um, <clears throat> Gotta refresh my memory with that. I did, okay, yeah. So the mare is a Long day breeder, and okay, a light signals. Yeah. Okay, so then here's the other thing that's kind of hard to figure out. For uh, for horses, they're seasonal breeders, they're long day breeders. That means when they see less and less melatonin, that's a signal to reproduce. So, like Jane said, you know, the melatonin inhibits. GnRH release, and then that prevents 
LH and FSH from being released, okay? Now sheep do just the opposite, right? Melatonin can't uh, suppress sheep reproduction because more melatonin stimulates reproduction, right? Just the opposite of the horse. So you have this same hormone, same pathway, but for sheep, it stimulates reproduction. For horses, it inhibits. So, I mean, they're different species. And of course, you might say, you know, sheep are short day breeders, but you know what? There are some sheep in the world that never read the textbook. They're gonna cycle all year round. I bet you there's maybe a few horses out there that you know didn't read the textbook in their uh, cycle all year round. But in general, horses are long day breeders. So are cats, by the way. Uh, dogs, they're they're not seasonal breeders. Okay, they've lost their seasonality. Cattle are not seasonal; they cycle all year round. I'm trying to see if we got all the animals here. Then we did horses, sheep, pigs. Their uh, cycle all year round. And Jane used the term seasonally polyesterous. Notice that? So then polyesterous means having many ester cycles when they are having ester cycles. Okay? So pigs are polyesterous. Horses are seasonally polyesterous. Sheep are seasonally polyesterous. Notice we're not talking about. The, the exact season, it's just certain seasons that they're going to cycle, okay? So that's the terminology. Um, I'm not sure what else I want to talk about. There's some, there's been some research where it shows, and you can read the cattle stuff, that cattle do respond by giving maybe more milk under a photo period. So that's a good little uh, uh, designation there, okay? Okay, I think I'm going to stop right there. You can read the stuff on your own. Um, see you next Wednesday for the exam, G126 in Lily. And what was the question? What was the, your question? Oh, that other that article, yeah. It said LD60. Yeah. And then there was like the comma, and then it said yeah, I don't know. Let me explore. I'm not sure.